science learners to another installment for you guys. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the human impact on the environment, but we're going to focus specifically on water, its availability, the quality, and its importance. And you and I know that water is essentially important for the survival of not just humans, but all forms of life. And let's look at what is it that we need to look at when we talk about water quality, its availability, and what happens in terms of with our available water for the future. It's important that while we do this lesson that you grab a glass of water and that you keep that available for you. From a physiological perspective, we know that water keeps us hydrated, allows us to focus, allows us to be able to process digestive enzymes and, uh, and, and, and reactions. So the importance of water is not just to the environment, but us as individuals. So let's remember that as we get through to this lesson. So in life sciences, we know that water has a significantly important role as a biological compound. Okay, we spent some time in grade 10 looking at inorganic chemistry where we talk about life sciences and water playing an important role. Have you ever thought about how safe is the tap water we drink? Okay, and do we have sufficient fresh water for a growing population? And I'm sure you guys have experienced this where you're actually thirsty at some point, you open a tap, and you're able to drink the water. And this is actually a privilege that we have because not in many countries are they able to open a tap and drink straight off the tap. So in terms of the quality of water we have, it's amazing that mo in most parts of South Africa, we're able to open a tap and drink consumable, potable water from that tap. And in terms of, you know, do we have enough water to sustain a human increasing population on Earth. And those are factors that we need to consider when we talk about the conservation of our freshwater systems and how pollution could impact on that. So let's not get detracted from what we're looking at today. Let's look at water and let's keep that to that point. So a question for you guys to think about. A water sample taken from a stream reveals the presence of the following invertebrates, leeches, a rat tail maggot, bloodworms, dragonfly larva. This indicates that the stream is A, clean and contains no pollutants, B, suitable for human consumption down the stream, C, severely polluted, D, polluted. And so from a biological perspective, so I will give you a, a hint to this. So think about this. So we refer to this list of living invertebrates that are inhabiting this water body. The question that I would ask you, if this water body of this sample of water was infected with or was contaminated with pollutants, would that water body be able to support life forms? The question is, the answer is more, than, more likely than not, those life forms would not exist. So think about that. So good quality water is actually measured by not just the ability for us to drink them, but the ability of that water sample to be able to support living organisms. And then sometimes from a biological indicator perspective, where we look at the biodiversity of water, a rich supply or a rich a presence of invertebrates in water can indicate the, the nature of good quality um, water which is again an indication of the nature of the environment. So remember that and use that information to be able to interpret the possible answer for this. Right, so in our lesson today, we're gonna focus on some key words and concepts that I'll unpack in the lesson, but let's look at these from a introductory perspective. So we're gonna look at water availability as a concept in terms of the amount of water that's available to us. The importance of wetlands are are natural and important to our environment. In terms of the impact of water pollution, what is irrigation and, and how water is being used there? Water purification and recycling as an important process to being able to use water and ensure that water is clean and recycled. Thermal pollution as a mechanism that contributes to de, de, uh, kind of affecting the water quality. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about algal bloom and what that means to the environment to the water bodies, a term that you've been exposed to probably previously in terms of the impact that 
fertilizers and nutrients have called eutrophication. We're going to look at the wastage of water as an important concept in terms of our conservation of water. And then, very important in terms of what alien plants are and how they impact on the availability of water in, in, in the water table and to other plants and organisms. So guys, where do you find water on Earth? And so you know that, I mean, if you were to look at the globe, you would see that predominantly most of the Earth is covered by water. The question is, how much of that water is available for humans to consume? And so not all of that water is consumable in terms of us being able to drink. And that's an important factor when we look at what is it that we're exposing ourselves to in terms of water and the impact that we have on water bodies that we're able to consume or drink from. So about 71% of the Earth's surface is water, and it's covered by this. And that includes our oceans, our seas, our rivers, streams, lakes, and dams. And the ocean holds about 96.5% of all of Earth's water. So of that, you can see there's probably a very small, less than 3%, it's probably less than 4% of the water that is not in the oceans. So it means that it's less than 4% of the water that we actually have, that we are exposed to, that we po possibly could consume, obviously through a process of purification and, 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 and distilling. So that water is a significantly small percent in terms of the amount of water on Earth that we as humans have access to. And consider that next time when we think about the wastage of water. Water also exists in the air as water vapor, in rivers and lakes, as I pointed out, in ice caps and glaciers, in the ground as well as soil moisture, and in aquifers, and even in the human body. As I said at the start of the lesson, we need lots of water in our body to keep us hydrated. A large percentage of our body, more than 70%, is made up of water. Again, a good comparison to what the composition of water is on Earth. So quite similar, and hence, water is fundamentally important for us as humans being able to survive from a physiological perspective. So let's consider these things, guys, as we get through the lesson. Right, so this, this image basically shows you that 2% of frozen water is in our glaciers and, and ice sheets, and we have less than 1% of liquid fresh water in our lakes, rivers, and undergrounds. And again, 97% of that is salty seawater. So if we looked at the, the, the less than 4% that we talk about, of that we have a mere 1% that we're able to process and consume as drinkable water. So that's a significantly small amount. And hence, let's again use that to remind us the importance of water to human existence. Okay, so South Africa is the 39 driest country in the world. The average rainfall of a country receives in a year is one way to measure how dry a country is. So, so we experience our rains, and that is essentially where we find condensation and precipitation contributing to the availability of water in our rivers and dams and lakes. So again, we rated probably amongst the top 40 countries in the world in terms of how dry we are. And that's again a significant factor in us considering the availability of water that we have to humans and animals. Okay, so data from food and agriculture organizations called Aquastat database provides comparable figures of 182 countries around the world. And these show basically, it is often reported that South Africa is the third, amongst that, the 30th driest country in the world. But the figure also shows that South Africa has had an annual rainfall of about 495 moving it into slightly down the ratings to 39 position. So, so we obviously experience significantly less rainfall compared to other countries in the world. And hence, that impacts on the how dry our country is and how much of water is available to South Africa. Okay, Piped water is less than 50%, uh, is, is sent to more than less than 50% of South African homes. So we assume that when we, where we live, that we can open our taps and get water running off the taps, but that's not the case. It's less than 50% of South African homes that have access to piped water. Yes, they do have access to water, but that's not necessarily piped to their homes. Again, they've got to go to communal 
watering holes or boreholes where water is actually provided and they've got to then transport that water to, to their homes. So again, it's important that when you let those taps run, consider that. While close to 90% of South African households can access piped water, on estimate, most of these households don't have water running directly into their homes. And so that is the 50% that I refer to. It's important that we consider that in terms of the availability of water to people. Okay, less than 46.4% of South Africans' households are estimated to have water piped into their homes. And of that, 26.8% have access to water on their property, while 13.3% need to share a communal tap. Again, we see that these stats point to how water is available, but not necessarily as efficiently and effectively available to the global context of people in our country. Right. So where is water used in South Africa? So what are some of our major consumers of water? We know that water drives, firstly, our domestic use, so we refer to water being used in our homes. There's urban use as well. We know that South Africa is a country that relies on a lot of agriculture, and hence we, spend to, we tend to use a lot of water on irrigation and our forestry. We know that South Africa, is, the economy is driven by mining and lots of industry. Lots of mines use a huge amount of water, and that water comes from the availability of the 1% that we're actually using in terms of that we can consume as well. A lot of the water is also used in our environment in terms of the evaporation, the precipitation, which is a natural phenomenon that does occur. So let's look at what human impacts have on the water supply. When we construct dams, dams have advantages as well as they have disadvantages. But dams are often constructed so that we can contain water and we're able to form these reservoirs of water that allows for people to have access. Again, we can get into a debate around construction of dams, where these and the impact that they have on communities and ecosystems in the areas. We also know that there's destruction of wetlands, and wetlands are areas that actually serve as sponges that absorb the water and return the water back into the water table that is then available to soil water that other plants and organisms can, can access. We also know that we have farming practices that are not necessarily efficient in terms of the conservation of water. Boreholes that are being constructed also tap into the groundwater. And so they, these contribute to the, the availability and the impact that we as humans have on the water available to people. Okay? We also know that there are exotic plantations, plantations of plants that are not naturally found in areas that tend to use more water than our indigenous species of plants. And so here now we find that these plants that are not naturally found in our uh, South African biomes tend to use more water than other indigenous plants. So again, an, a human impact because we're bringing in these exotic plants. Wastage from the way water is lost through leakages, through poor plumbing uh, and, 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 and facilities that we have in our homes. The fact that urbanization takes huge impact on populations in urban cities and how they tend to use more water as well as pollute them. And then the impact of pollution on these water bodies need to be considered. Factors that reduce the quality of water. So in terms of when we talk of water, we also need to consider the quality of water. So guys, we're going to get into this segment and we're going to unpack what is quality of water and these factors. So as we end the segment, have a good glass of nice portable water, get back at the end hydrated and ready for our next segment where we talk about the quality of water that you've just had to drink. See you in a bit. Welcome back life science learners. I'm sure you've had a good glass of cool water that's portable or in the, in, in, in the, in the context of another description that was easy to drink, so consumable. So we're going to refer to the terms portable and unportable now. So, so we're going to look at those factors that reduce the quality of water. So what is it that impacts on the availability and the quality of water in the context of our environment? So 
the first thing we need to look at is the concept of eutrophication. So when we talk of eutrophication, we're talking about the buildup of nitrates in water bodies and how that contributes to the changing of the quality of water, as well as algal bloom, which is a growth of excessive amounts of algae in the water, and we look at its impact. We're going to look at thermal pollution as a concept, and what thermal pollution is is essentially the pollution of water where the temperature of the water increases. And that often happens because of industries that use the water bodies to either cool or heat up their, their, their refineries or their processes that they use in industry. So that's that impact. Domestic use, industry, agricultural leading to pollution and disease. So how water is used domestically as well as in industries and how they produce affluents or pollutants that change the quality of water. Mining as well, as I spoke to you about earlier on, and then alien plants such as black wattles and blue gums that are not indigenous to the context of a South African environment, but end up using more water than our indigenous plants. So those are factors that reduce the quality of water in our areas. So let's unpack what algal bloom is. So algal will come from the word algae, and algae is obviously a type of marine, uh, aquatic organism that lives in, in water. And these are plants that basically are able to photosynthesize. So algal blooms is defined as the rapid growth and accumulation of algae in aquatic ecosystems. So, so algae generally tends to grow in water bodies. Uh, the more stagnant the water bodies, the more pre predominant you find algae is. But however, there are certain factors that cause an increase in the growth of algae. And this growth is not always conducive to the living of other marine or aquatic organisms. So let's look at what an algal bloom is and try and understand the impact. So harmful algal blooms are algal blooms composed of phytoplankton, known, as n known to naturally produce biotoxins that are harmful to the resident population as well as humans. Now, as I said, these algal blooms are a rapid increase in the growth of algae. However, these are composed of phytoplanktons that produce certain harmful chemicals, which we call biotoxins, which are naturally produced by these algae. And when they tend to grow rapidly in an environment, they produce these chemicals that are released into the water bodies that often affect the residents. So in the terms of the water body, if it's in a dam, if it's in a lake, you'll find that these biotoxins start accumulating in the water bodies, causing or affecting the, the, the fish, the in invertebrates, and other organisms, as well as humans that consume these water along, uh, al along, the, uh, along where these water bodies are. So you'll find that the impact is not just on the organisms that live in it, but also on humans. The presence of these harmful algal blooms leads to the fish dying. It leads to fish obviously becoming sick, as well as human sickness, which is affected by humans either consuming the water or secondly, consuming the fish and the marine or the, the, the organisms present that live in these water bodies. Okay, so here's an example and here you can see algal bloom and this is a, a, a kind of a picture that you will see in, in, in Gauteng where you're going along to the Hartebius Poor Dam and there you can see uh, the presence of algal blooms in this area. Again, we'll discuss why this happens in the next slide. So what causes algal blooms? So algal blooms are caused by excessive amounts of nitrates, phosphates, and nutrients entering the aquatic ecosystem. Now, nitrates, phosphates, and nutrients are not necessarily where individuals pour these into the water bodies, but this is coming from runoff water, from local agricultural areas, so where people are planting and growing crop, and they are using nitrates and phosphates and nutrients to increase the growth of their crops, you'll find that when it rains, some of those nutrients are running off into the, these water bodies, accumulating in them, and then supplying these algae with the nutrients to promote their rapid growth. And that's essentially what's happening. And these often discharge from the sewage treatment plants, as well as septic tanks, stormwater, runoff fertilizer, lawns, and farms. So it's not just from agriculture, but as you can see, it's from even septic tanks, it's from stormwater drains that run off into these river bodies or these lakes. Other factors that aid algal growth include sunlight and slow moving water. So as I said, 
obviously we see lots of algae that require sunlight. And so when algae tend to, when water bodies tend to be stagnant or slow moving, you'll find that the algae tend to grow rapidly in those areas because they're exposed to more sunlight, the temperatures in the water are slightly higher, and it's conducive for them to actually grow extremely rapidly. Okay, so another concept that we need to look at is eutrophication. And I know that the word sounds a bit complicated. Let's try and unpack the word eutrophication. It's similar to algal bloom, but let's try and understand essentially what eutrophication is. So eutrophication is the gradual increase in the concentration of phosphorus, nitrogen, and other plant nutrients in aging aquatic ecosystems such as lakes. The productivity or fertility of such an ecosystem naturally increases as the amount of organic material that, that can be broken down into the nutrient increases. So again, very similar to algal blooms, but now we're seeing that there is again an increase in the amount of nutrients, nitrogen, as well as phosphorus into these water bodies that starts to increase the growth of aquatic plants. And this will have an impact now on other living organisms that live in that. So the accumulation of biotoxins, as well as the reduction of light to the plants, to the organisms that live uh, below the surface of the layer. So eutrophication is predominantly caused by human actions due to dependence on using nitrates and phosphorus first fertilizers, agricultural practices, and the use of fertilizers on lawns, golf courses, and other fields contribute to phosphates and nitrates accumulating in our water bodies. And this has now an, an impact on the growth. So this illustration that we have can sh shows you essentially what happens with eutrophication. Here we see that nitrogen from the atmosphere as well as phosphates from the atmosphere and the environment run off into these wa water bodies. The phytoplanktons in this tend to use these and they tend to grow rapidly. And as they grow, you find that there's a bloom of algae on the surface. The algae die, they decay, you need oxygen, they produce biotoxins. And these biotoxins start producing what we call uh, harmful chemicals that start to affect the other organisms. Eventually, the algal bloom increases, creating a layer on the surface of the water that stops the sunlight from getting into the phytoplankton and further reducing the biodiversity of living organisms in these water bodies. Essentially, the water now, the quality of that water changes, the ability of other organisms to survive in that water because of the accumulation of the biotoxins is compromised, and we see that now we have fish that die, we see other aquatic organisms being affected. Right, so what are the effects? Primarily, the adverse effects of eutrophication on aquatic bodies include the decrease of biodiversity, the increasing toxicity of the water body and the change in the species dominance. So you'll find that because of the accumulation of algae and the impact that those biotoxins have, we find that it reduces biodiversity, meaning that it reduces the diversity of living organisms in these water bodies, leading to the accumulation of certain toxins. And in these water bodies, certain species that are adapted to this will survive. So we see that a dominant species that is not naturally um, kind of conduce, uh, ideally suited to that area starts to take over. And this starts seeing a shift in a predominantly new species that takes over that, which is generally not ideal in terms of them replacing the, the current prevalent species that we would have seen before um, the impact of eutrophication. Okay, some other important effects of this process are listed below. So the phytoplanktons grow much faster in such situations. You'll find that these Phytoplankton sometimes are a species that produce toxic uh, waste products and are inedible so that other marine organisms cannot consume these. So it means that there's a lack of food now. Uh, you'll also find that certain zooplankton, gelatinous zooplankton, form fast on these waters and make the water very uh, gelatinous in terms of like jelly-like. So the water body becomes difficult for uh, your birds and your aquatic organisms to even swim into. So you find that they start finding it difficult to inhabit those water bodies. The water loss, there's loss in transparency of the water, and the water sometimes develops a bad smell and color. And the treatment of this water becomes even more challenging 
to make that quality of water more accessible to human consumption. The depletion of dissolved oxygen in the water body means that now the organisms that live in there have less oxygen for natural processes such as respiration. So we're seeing the impact not just on the quality of water, but again on the individuals that live there. We see that there's frequent fish kill included, which, which you will see. And many fish, uh, species of fish are removed from the water body, not by choice, but purely because they're not able to adapt to a changing composition of water. Sometimes you see the fish kind of uh, lying on the side of these river bodies, and that's because of a process where the water has now less oxygen, and you'll find that these fish are, uh, cannot respire, and we call that process asphyxiation, where they now are deprived of oxygen, and they no longer can breathe or respire naturally. Okay, some other important eff effects would be that the populations of shellfish and, uh, uh, that we use and harvest for commercial, those are lowered. The aesthetic value of the water body diminishes significantly. And if you've been to a lake, or if you've been to a dam where you've seen lots of eutrophication, you'll find that industries such as uh, boating, um, water spots are all affected by these algal growth and eutrophication. So the impact is not just on the water body, but even on industries and the livelihoods of people that inhabit or use these water bodies. We also know that uh, it's important for us to talk about the quality of water. A and that quality of water talks to one, the availability of water for human consumption, and second, the availability of that water to support a diversity of living organisms. So let's try and unpack what water quality is from a human consumption perspective first, and then we'll relate that to how it supports living organisms. So water quality is a measure by several factors, such as the concentration of dissolved oxygen, bacteria levels, the amount of salts, or how saline the water is, and the amount of material suspended in the water. We refer to that as turbidity, okay? So in some bodies of water, you'll find that there's a concentration of microscopic algae, the quantities of, and quantities of pesticides and herbicides that have run off from farms. Heavy metals from factories and other contaminants may also be measured, which determine the quality of water. So the quality of water is not necessarily whether it's consumable for humans, but it's also, is it conducive for other living organisms to live in? And as we started off in our first segment, the multiple choice question was referring to a water body that had a whole lot of a healthy invertebrate population in them. And so the question is, you know, was that water body suitable? Was it polluted? Was it mildly or heavily polluted? And that talks to, again, the quality of that water. So let's look at how quality of water is affected. The quality of drinking water is important for health and well-being. And you would know that if you're consuming water that it's got contaminants and it's got um, impurities, that's going to affect your health. So if it has bacteria and that needs to be processed, we know that, again, bacteria can contaminate and affect humans. So we've got to consider what's present in water in terms of the quality that is being affected. Okay, we use water daily throughout our homes for cooking, for cleaning, for bathing, for laundry, and a host of other purposes, and hence the quality is very important. Water is critical to most items we purchase and consume in, our, in one way or the other. This illustration shows you the difference between what we call turbid water, and this is a water that has got a lot of suspended uh, particles in it, so that's turbidity. And here we, we, this is more water that is potable. Potable in the sense that this is water that has been cleaned, purified, and gone through a process of processing, which makes the water potable for human consumption. And it's important that we understand that water that we get in our tap is water that has gone through a process of processing, cleaning, and removal of waste products and impurities, including uh, bacteria and viruses that may be contaminating them. And hence you'll find that for us to be able to value that glass of fresh water that we have, we've got to understand that, that the quality of water has been through because of various processes that ensure a high quality of water that we have and we're able to consume off a tap. So on that note of good quality water, I'd like to give you guys a 
good break, I challenge you to go and have some water and open your taps and look at how clean the water is. Smell the water and understand that that water is because of the process of purification and processing that we're able to have portable water in our taps. So hydrate and see you after the break. Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our final segment. In this segment, we're looking at some of the applications of what we've just discussed. As a recap of what we've just completed, we've looked at water, we've looked at factors that affect the quality of water, we've looked at algal blooms, we've looked at eutrophication. And before we got into a break, I spoke about how portable water is in our taps. Now let's look at the application of that with a few questions. So when we look at a study that was done, a group of learners were looking at uh, conducting an investigation. Let's read what they've done. So a group of learners conducted an investigation to determine the average amount of water used by a household for different purposes. They collected data on water use from five different families in their neighborhood. The results are shown in the table on the next slide. So guys, it's a simple routine kind of investigation that was done where a few learners got together and they went around collecting data. And it's amazing how you, from collecting data, can get a better understanding of trends or the way something is being used. So what better way to see the impact that we have on the environment? Let's do a simple experiment. And that was their objective. So let's look at what information they collected from their investigation. So they tried to establish what was the purpose of which water was used, and so they looked at different criteria that water was being used for, and they also asked the participants or their households to measure the average amount of water that was used. And so this information was collected for one, the flushing of toilets, two, the bath and showers, three, gardening, four, washing clothes and dishes, and cooking and drinking water. And they measured that average amount of water as a percentage of what they, these households used. So if you look at the data table, you will see that there's a large percentage of water that's being used for flushing. And then we see a significant amount, almost a quarter of the water that we used in the households were used for baths and showers. And we see that percentage was used for gardening and probably for keeping their lawns or probably uh, if they've had vegetables growing. We see that 20% of it was used for washing clothes and cooking and drinking was a significantly smaller percentage. What's interesting to remember and to link this to is that in most households, the most amount of water that is being used is for the, for the flushing of our toilets. And if you think and reflect on that, often when we use the bathroom, we tend to have a complete flush and we often spend uh, probably 10 to 12 liters of water flushing down um, after we've used the bath. Now that often means that when we use the bath, every time a family member uses that bath, every time you flush, we do spend a large amount of water that has to be used to ensure that the bathrooms are clean. However, we've also got much more developed and more modern energy and, and efficient water saving um, flushing mechanisms that reduce the amount of water that's being used. And I suppose this is a behavior change as well as looking at how we've got now more modern and more advanced um, mechanisms and plumbing f features that allow us to save water. And if you want to conserve water in your household, try and look at how much of water is actually being used to flush down when we are flushing our toilets. Okay, so this is what they collected. And again, very important exercise in terms of establishing actually where is most of the water uh, being used. So, a few questions that they had to put together that they had to respond to. So firstly, in this study, identify the following. So the dependent variable. And so guys, when we look at this table, we can see that the investigation was carried out to look at what was the purpose for which water was used and the average amount of water that was used. And that was calculated as a percentage that we see. What's important to understand is that in any experiment, there are several variables that are used and we have the independent variable, 
we have the dependent variable, and we ho have a whole lot of control variables. And in this investigation, the question that you ask to determine the dependent variable is, what is being measured that helps us to draw a conclusion or to collect data? And clearly in this investigation, it was the average amount of water that was used, and that was converted to a percentage. So our dependent variable in this experiment is the average amount of water used, and that was in a percentage. So the average amount of water used, and that was the dependent variable. Hold on if you got that. The independent variable is essentially what is being investigated. What is it that the, these learners had control over in terms of trying to find information about? So they decided to find out information on what was the purpose of the water being used. So they established that that was going to be their independent variable. So the different uses of water or the purpose of water is the independent variable. So it was the different purposes of water. So we could call that the different purpose of water. And you can see that they went around to those five households and they established exactly what were the purposes that water was being used for and they were able to measure the uh, percentage that was being used. So that's quite an interesting question and it's important to establish that at the onset of an experiment. The next question reads, state two ways in which the reliability of the results can be improved. Now guys, remember that in any investigation, the results that you collect are generally looked at and reviewed. So when we talk about scientific skills, we've got to reflect on our investigation and talk about the reliability. If you read the preamble to this, these learners went to five households and they collected information in their neighborhood. The question that is now relating to how reliable is this information and how can we improve this? Well, firstly, we got to give the learners the benefit of the doubt is that in that they've gone around to five households and they've not just looked at an individual house. However, we can also comment on whether this information is reliable in the greater context of the neighborhood. All they did was they sampled five households. Maybe in terms of to improve the accuracy of their results, they could look at sampling a larger number of households for probably the entire street or individuals in different streets. And I suppose their objective was to establish what was the trend, what was the use, what is the behavior of individuals. And hence, the more samples they use, the more reliable their results become. And I think that is very important in terms of improving any scientific experiment. It's being able to increase the reliability by looking at sample size and the range that we're looking at. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the next question. Draw a pie chart to represent the data in the table. Show all your calculations, and that's a seven mark question. And guys, this takes us back to those lessons where we've discussed the scientific skills, and we discussed how data needs to be presented. And in this question, they point us specifically to presenting the information in a pie chart. So the question is, why would they want us to illustrate that information in a pie chart? Often, pie charts are graphical illustrations that show you the proportions of the different components that make up a study. And this example requires that we illustrate the percentage use of water in a pie chart. And that would give us a visual representation of how water is being used. So, and again, the question requires that you show your data. So let's look at how this is calculated and then how we plot that. So the calculations for proportions for each slice are shown in the pie chart below. Remember that it is important for us to first, because this is given to us in a percentage, we've got to work that out as a proportion out of 360. So remember that there was 30% used for flushing, so that's 30 divided by 100 times 300, and that gives us a value of 108, and we've used the same rationale for calculating the 25% as a proportion of 100, and we've multiplied that by 360, because we know that a pie chart has 360 degrees, and so that gives us 90 degrees 
using your protractor. Gardening was 15% and that equates to 54 degrees on a protractor. Then washing clothes and dishes again was 20% which is 72 degrees on a protractor and cooking in water which was 10% and then converted to a degree using a protractor of 36 degrees. So that's essentially the calculation. So when constructing a pie chart, it's important that we add the total number of the dependent variable. In this case, we were fortunate that it was in a percentage. We add that up and we calculate that as a proportion out of 360. So in this case, we converted that proportion to a percentage or a degree out of 360. And we've got to use our calculator so that we ensure that our calculations are accurate. Remember that we've got to round up or round down to ensure that we don't have the degrees exceeding 360 or being less than 360. So remember to total and use these as a rounding up and rounding off at the end. So add these up to see if they're equal to 360 so that you have them proportionately correct and then you plot that into a pie chart. Now let's look at a pie chart. Again, I've illustrated the percentages up here so that we can look at that. Remember that the golden rule is when we start drawing a pie chart, find a central point from which you can place your protractor. Place your protractor over that area and then extrapolate using your protractor and establish for the first proportion in this case was 108. And so using, you count that out and you place a line here and you draw that first segment out. And then you then transfer your protractor to using that as the base and you now measure the next angle which is 90 degrees from that and so that takes us to the next proportion and you then continue doing that until you have plotted each of the five or six segments collectively into a, com into a complete pie chart. And so here is a, a visual representation using color of how those are presented. What's important is if, if your teacher was marking this that they were going to look for the heading and the heading in this case shows you the average amount of water used for households uh, for different purposes. So that's a complete heading. It's a pie chart that shows that. We've got a key that illustrates what the different components are. And we've got these proportionately distributed, correctly calculated. So the proportions and the segments are measured accurately. And that would be the three marks that you would get for that. And so it's important that you use the key in presenting a pie chart and that allows again for the reader to be able to understand what these different symbols or colors or proportions illustrate when looking at the dependent variable. Cool. Okay. Describe one advantage of making the results of their survey available to the various households that participated. So guys, the objective of the investigation was to look at the behavior of individuals or the five households in terms of how, what was the purpose or how did they use water. And I suppose in carrying out investigation, it's important that you share your information so that individuals are able to understand the, the, the context of why that investigation was done. And often I think this is a very good idea that if you've gone around and collected information of something that's very important in this case, the use of water, People often not able to do this are able to see the impact or the way and manner in which they use. So I would certainly think that it would be an excellent idea for them to be able to share their results. One, for pe people to be able to reflect and two, for them to get a better understanding of what the general trend of five households are. And this could lead to an understanding of individuals, a change of behavior and probably an, a, a better understanding in the context of individuals and their impact on their environment. Cool. Describe one advantage, and I just did that, did that. So we said the greatest water was allowed them to develop strategies to reduce the water use in that area. And again, if you looked at that, if individuals were aware that they were using a lot of water to flush down their toilets, they probably would find a new mechanism, a more modern mechanism that reduces the amount of water that is being flush down the toilet um, to ensure that they're saving water and they're using water more wisely. 
Great. Okay. So the next question, describe how alien plants may reduce both the availability and the quality of water. Now guys, as I discussed earlier on, I mentioned that alien plants are plants that are not indigenous to an area. And so these plants are brought in by, by, by different people into a, a, an environment that is, uh, that is not natural to them. Often it's carried by people that have settled into an area, either intentionally by bringing plants or accidentally through seeds, and those plants establish in an area where they can grow much easier. And so these plants would affect the availability of water. So you'll find that alien plants may use excessively more water, and this would reduce the amount of water available for natural vegetation in that area. And this means that now you are reducing the availability of water to indigenous plants. Alien invasive plants also block waterways, reducing light to the other aquatic plants. These plants eventually die de and decompose. The bacteria that decompose these plants eventually deplete the oxygen supply in the water and further affect the quality of water in an area. Before we wrap up, one last question. Describe how poor farming practices may reduce both the availability and the quality of water. And guys, it's important to understand that a large amount of water is used in farming. And so for us to be able to effectively save water but ensure that water is used in the correct way to ensure that there's maximum productivity, we need to look at ways in which that processes can be refined and made much more conservatively to ensure maximum and best use of water. Okay, so overgrazing leads to soil erosion and hence you can see that when the soil is eroded, water runs off rapidly from the surface and is not absorbed into the soil. So having vegetation slows down the movement of water and that allows for more water to be able to absorb into the surface. So it's important that we prevent overgrazing. Okay, the use of fertilizers and pesticides may pollute nearby dams and water and rivers, reducing the quality of water available. And we saw that with eutrophication. So these are two simple mechanisms that can ensure that the quality of water as well as the use in the way we, uh, the use of water can be, better or, or a better kind of, I think, used by farmers to ensure that there's reduce, redu reduction, sorry, in the amount of water available. So guys, I'm rushing to finish this section. I know that you guys are, are there waiting for your next glass of portable water. I want to end off the session and wish you well, and I hope to see you guys in the next section when we talk about the impact that humans have in terms of food security in the environment. Take care, go well, Drink lots of water, stay healthy. Goodbye.